Welcome to Pullback, the podcast where we challenge ourselves to try something new in ethical consumption. Then we tell you what we learned, fuck ups and all. I'm Kristen Pugh, and I'm here with Kyla Hewson. Hello. And this is our first episode in our summer series on consumer electronics. Hooray! <laughs> Hooray! <Technology>. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I'm excited for you to teach us how computers work. <laughs> oh, yeah. You told me to do that yesterday. And I was like, sure. And then I didn't prep at all. So <laughs> let's do this off off the cuff. I think I can do it. Yeah, we've been putting off. Um, I don't know if you notice this, but I have been putting off electronics as an episode for pretty much a year now because I <laughs> do not understand how computers work at all. <laughs> oh, like, no. <laughs> how the hell am I going to research the ethics of these things? But it turns out, um, for most of it, you don't really need to know what the components are. So, Oh, okay, great. <laughs> but essentially, uh, just to give you guys a rundown on uh, what you're going to get, we've got two episodes that are going to look at the ethics behind consumer electronics. So today, we're going to focus on human rights and consumer electronics. And then the next episode, we'll focus on the environment. Um, and it'll also look at e-waste a little bit. And then we thought it would also be helpful to do an episode on conflict minerals specifically because that's a huge topic in um, not only for the electronics industry, but also for other industries like jewelry. Um, and so we'll, we'll do that afterwards. Uh, and then we'll do an interview episode on e-waste. Nice. I hope we'll actually do that. So <laughs> 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 now, now we're held to it. Yeah, no, nobody, nobody remember this. I feel like at the end of our series, nobody's going to remember what we said at the beginning of it. That's absolutely true. But yeah, so we'll, we'll be doing, um, we'll be breaking down electronics into several different episodes. Uh, so if you get to the end of this part and you're like, I'm not really clear on what we do, <laughs> it's because that's coming later. So stay tuned. For some reason, I thought the best way to start this was to just observe that um, most of the consumer electronics that are ubiquitous today didn't exist 50 years ago. So I wasted a couple of hours looking at when different kinds of electronics were invented because um, I thought it was interesting personally. <laughs> so <laughs> maybe talk a little bit about that. Um, the first television uh, was produced in 1929. So it was pretty old. Uh, the first electrical computer was pretty shortly after that, 1938. So like, Prior to the the Second World War, you do have like some of these technologies that are starting to be produced, but like nobody had a computer in the 30s. Um, there weren't personal computers until 1974, really. So like it's really only since the 70s that we start to have um, electronics other than televisions and radios that are in our houses um, commonly. That's less than 100 years old. I know. It's wild. It's uh. I mean, if you think about it, like on the arc of time with the plastic bag, it's about the same oh, amount of time. That's true. <laughs> and like, I know that I know that computers aren't that like, I know that they're really new, but it's just it's sometimes it, it like, they feel so ingrained in our daily lives that it's, it's easy to forget like, oh, yeah, m my great grandmother remembers a time before computers, you know, or even my, well, my grandma was my grandma's pretty young, but definitely my great grandma. <laughs> Okay, I want you to Google the Magnavox Odyssey. Have you ever seen that video game console before? No. Was that your first console? No, I, 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 I was not alive when this came out. It's uh, <laughs> the first video game console that um, was sold, and it was came out in 1972. Okay, I'm excited to see this. One second. Magnavox Odyssey. Oh. <laughs> What did it do? <laughs> uh, not a lot. So the weird thing about this console, I don't know if what you've found on Google shows you this. Um, it basically all it did was flash lights because it was so old. Um, and it had like a ping pong game and a couple of other games. But instead of actually having video game graphics, because it couldn't do that, um, you had to place these like plastic overlays over top of your television and it just like stuck there and it provided the frame for whatever you were doing. <laughs> so like they had one that was like a haunted house, they had a tennis court, a hockey rink, stuff like that. And like whatever game you were playing, you had to put the plastic sheet up. Otherwise, it would just be like lights. <laughs> and you like twisted the device forward and backward to choose direct. It's very weird. Um, super old game. I think it like shows the distance in 
really like about 50 years we've gotten from that to video game graphics are so good now um, that it practically look real. Or even vi- like virtual reality has really... Yeah, God. Uh, have you ever used a, vir- a virtual reality machine or glasses? I haven't. No, have you? I have. One of my friends like built a full rig and I played with it for maybe two hours and it was incredible. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. you know what I think is funny? Um, I was thinking about this the other day, but like Star Trek imagines these like holodecks where like the room is what creates the environment. It's like, bros, just put the goggles on over your eyes. <laughs> 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 you dummies. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Um, so yeah, the first uh, video game console, if you can really call it that, it was a box with flashing lights, um, was 1972. <laughs> the first mobile phone, do you think it was before or after the Magnavox Odyssey? Um, oh my god, and the Odyssey <laughs> came out in 1974, you said? 1972. I would think that the cell phone would come after it? It is, yeah. This was actually a super <gasps> tricky question because it came the next year. <laughs> <laughs> but I was just being tricksy. Wow, they were th- that's crazy. <laughs> yeah, so Motorola released the first mobile phone in 1973 and the first digital camera came out 2 years later. So things are starting to speed up in the 70s. It's the the decade of technology. Uh then the Sony Walkman rounds out the decade becoming the first portable music player and It's one of the earliest wearable technologies, if you want to think about it in that way. And then the first laptop comes out in the early 80s. Um, It was very heavy. (laughs) (laughs) So yeah, then you have um, in 1992, there's the first smartphone. Um, But really, the first smartphone that everybody thinks about is the iPhone that comes out in 2001. Or sorry, in 2007. um, And the iPod comes out in 2001. I was like, wait a second. (laughs) Mixed up the Apple products. The first iPod comes out in 2001 and the first iPhone comes out in 2007. So that may, okay, yeah. I mean, I guess we had most of these things by like the end of the 80s, but they weren't good until, I mean, are they good now? I don't know. They're pretty good now. (laughs) See what we say in 10 years. Um, But yeah. I I just want to like, I wanted to give that history because um, a lot of the context you've got to give to the industry, um, I think is partially framed around how quickly technologies change, right? If you think about like cell phones coming out, like really not being in popular use until the 90s and then smartphones kind of getting introduced in like the mid 2000s and getting better and better and better all the time, like um, what we'll talk about a lot in this episode is how like the short time frame of technology um, creates a lot of problems in the industry. But it's also kind of understandable when you have these like big leaps in the functionality of technology happening in the last couple of decades. Although, frankly, I think lately that's slowed down, but I'm also not a tech wonk, so <laughs> I'm wrong. <laughs> I don't know. My most, I have an iPhone. Maybe I shouldn't, but I do. Um, And it is pretty much the same as previous iPhones I've had, you know. So we'll talk about all that stuff. So what are in electronics? That was something that I wondered. I was like, probably metal and plastic was what I guessed. (laughs) (laughs) And that is that is true. Um, So electronics are made up of plastic, um, silicon, and then also like just a really wide array of chemical elements, um, including metals, and also rare earth elements. So we'll talk about those because they end up being important to the ethics. Silicon, though, is really important to electronics because they're the backbone of microchips. Oh my god, is that why it's called Silicon Valley? (laughs) 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 Am I supposed to have known that? Is anyone else discovering this for the very first time? Please, please tweet me and let us know at Pullback Podcast because I am shook right now. (laughs) Oh, man. Yeah, that's that's probably why it's called that. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, man. Um, So, yeah, they're a really important component of microchips. Um, Basically, they're like the frame on which you print the, like, electronic circuits. So, like, you have to get... Um, what's called a, a silicon wafer. Um, I don't remember exactly how that's made, but silicon is basically sand. 
And so it's it's like a refined version of sand, basically. So that is one of the most important materials when it comes to consumer electronics or electronics of any kind. And fun fact, there are more than 634 billion microchips manufactured annually. <laughs> so. Oh, I think I saw that statistic recently because there was a shortage on microchips like in the last three weeks and people were saying it was going to grind, like the planet was going to grind to a halt. And and I was like, whoa. <laughs> but yeah, it's because they make so many microchips. If you can't make them anymore, it's like, actually, that is a problem. Yes. Um, and I didn't look up anything on the, the microchip shortage, but I have also heard that's a thing. Sorry, listeners, if that's really important. <laughs> <laughs> Tweet us angrily about that too. <laughs> Absolutely. So one of the challenges that I came across in researching for this episode is um, that there are so many fucking things in electronics. Uh, uh, so, for example, the average smartphone has about 70 chemical elements in it. So I don't really know what you do with that. <laughs> it's, it's pretty... I'm not going to go through all 70... And plus, I th that's just one smartphone. You know, every smartphone is probably made up of different things. And then laptops are made of different things. And TVs and video game consoles, you know, would get really overwhelming. Um, so what I thought I would do is kind of like talk about um, some of the major categories as they come up in the ethical issues. And one of the things that's really important to talk about is um, what's called rare earth elements. Um, had you ever heard of those before? Yes, but I probably because you told me about them because you actually did a whole bunch of research on this in the past, right? Yeah. Um, so rare earth elements, um, they're called that because at the time they thought they were really rare, but turns out they're actually not so rare. <laughs> And they're, they're really essential to modern technology. And there are different reasons because there are basically 17 rare earth elements. Um, and they're elements that are common in low concentrations in the Earth's crust. So at one time, we kind of thought they only were present in one place. But now we know they're present all over the place, just in low concentrations. And those 17 elements do a whole bunch of like different things. They have a different conductive properties, different magnetic properties, different phosphorescent properties. And so those different properties mean that you can use them in different ways in technology. So if you want like a screen that flashes with different colors, you use different rare earth elements, you know, um, something, something conductivity. <laughs> I don't know how electronics work, but, you know, you need you need the different features of different earth, rare earth elements to be able to um, produce different things in your phone. So for example, um, I don't remember which one of them this is, but one of the rare earth elements allows your phone to vibrate, you know? Wow. Yeah. And it's just like the properties of the rare earth elements that are different that help them to do different things, but. Well, I just learned that alchemy is real. <laughs> <laughs> and it really does do magic. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure I'm sure people who are like engineers would be like very upset with me about the way I've described this because I'm sure there's a perfectly reasonable way that they they make them vibrate. But the point being that you need um you need a lot of elements um, in electronics because you need them to like they're really complicated. You need them to be able to do a bunch of different things. Um, so I tried to I was when I'm researching this episode, I always try to to look at what the supply chain is, um, even though that's often really boring, I think it's really important to understanding what the, you know, ethical problems that might be run into are. And th this is where, like, I ran into my first problem with electronics. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, we thought that the clothing series was complicated, but electronics are just, they themselves are so complex that the supply chains are just orders of magnitude more complicated than any of the other products we've discussed on the podcast so far. But I'll try to sort of go through basically how it works. So the first step and something we'll talk a lot about in um, the first two parts of the series are um, each of the like raw materials themselves um, have to be mined and processed. So think about like those 70 different materials in going into your smartphone. All of those get mined and refined in a multi-step process. So, you know, those are all separate, complicated things that are happening. But if we'll just summarize them as they get, they get mined and refined, and then the raw materials are brought to build um, electronic components. Can you maybe, at this point, it might be helpful for you to describe, um, like, what generally is in a computer? What are the sort of main things so people can get a sense? 
yes, I'd be happy to do that. So when you're building a computer, it's generally the same principles for whether you're building a laptop or a desktop. You need basically the same things. They just come in different sizes. So the first thing you need is a case, the thing that everything goes inside and holds it all together. Then you're going to need a motherboard and a processor. They're the brain of your computer. Well, the processor is the brain of your computer and the motherboard is like the spine and the, the nervous system. Everything connects to it and uh, they all react to each other because of the way that they're connected to the motherboard. I <laughs> am going to have a great time describing the rest of this. <laughs> I, I feel like I should give some credentials here. <laughs> I, I built and repaired and sold computers for three years. I started as a salesperson, then I moved on to be a tech for a while, and then went back to sales. So I actually do know what I'm talking about. <laughs> I'm just like... <laughs> Not all there tonight. Uh, the next thing you're going to want for your computer is memory or random access memory. So other people call it RAM. And that I always describe to people is kind of like your table. Uh, the more RAM you have, the bigger your table is, the more things you can do at once. I'm sure that engineers are going to hate that description as well. But <laughs> <laughs> uh, the next thing you're going to want is your hard drive. That's where you store all of your pictures and music and programs and your operating system. And the next thing you're going to want is mm, your motherboard's going to come equipped with like a sound card and most of them will come equipped with a video card and lots of them will come equipped with like a wireless chip. So your motherboard will have built-in processes to give you Wi-Fi and video and sound. But if you have a really shitty <laughs> motherboard or a really small one like me, you have to get external pieces for those as well. So your video card is like a second motherboard processor RAM unit. So it's like a computer inside a computer so that you can play all of those great VR video games. And then the sound card and the wireless internet card basically is what people want. And then your power supply to make it all run. And different power supplies can run different setups. Pretty easy stuff. And then you can like add things for fun, you know, like, oh, because you, you can't just have a computer. You also need a keyboard and a mouse and speakers and <laughs> ah. monitors to see stuff. Yeah, I mean, if you're getting a laptop, that's built into the case, but still, like, woof. Yeah. So, I mean, that's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> so you take all of the elements that are um, like the originally raw materials, they get mined, they get refined, and then they go to make that big jumble of components, many of which are like made by, it's not necessarily all separate companies, but usually there are like hardware component manufacturers that will make um, certain elements. And it gets confusing because some of those hardware manufacturers are also like the like the branded uh, computer producers that like also sell you the stuff. And then there's also operating system and software developers that are also sometimes in hardware as well. So the companies are all jumbled up, but the process is basically you get raw materials, you make raw materials not suck, you bring raw materials to make components, you put components together through like an assembly factory, and then you like send it to stores and sell it. Or you send it to telecoms companies who sell it that way too. <laughs> <laughs> um, so there's also like, um, what you might notice in that system is there's a lot of subcontracting that happens throughout that process. So if you're like a big company like like Apple, for example, um, they use over 750 suppliers to build their products. Like, that's a massive number of companies you're contracting to. So, like, in our clothing episode, we talk about how subcontracting really makes transparency and accountability difficult because you're not quite sure, like, who's cutting your cloth and whatever. You magnify that problem by, like, 100 if you're dealing with electronics because there are so many components. And that's where a lot of the problems come in, that and the fact that we don't have electronic devices for a very long time. So human rights abuses largely occur in the mining and manufacturing stages of the supply chain. It's not so much like the people that are at the, the end of the supply chain that are dealing with human rights issues, although I'm sure pay at some of these um, stores is not great. But the big human rights abuses occur mostly sort of at the beginning stages, the mining, the manufacturing, the assembly. 
Um, and so that's how I'm going to organize the human rights section. We'll ta- start by talking about mining, then we'll talk about manufacturing. Just a note that I am not going to talk about every raw material in this episode, so um, we'll focus on just a few that have been the subject of activism and uh, talk about general principles. And if you want to research like cobalt mines or copper mines afterwards, like go off, <laughs> you know. <laughs> <laughs> A lot of the mining issues, like there'll be egregious human rights abuses at like this one Zambian copper mine or like something somewhere else. Um, So what I've tried to do is talk about broadly what happens in mining. I did look up where key materials were mined. I'm not going to go through a list of those, but um, China is a big producer of most of the really important uh, raw materials that go into electronics. So they're a country that definitely plays a big role. Australia is also a big mining company that's one of the lead producers on a number of them. The United States comes up a few times, Peru, Russia, India, and Canada. So uh, those are some of the major mining uh, countries. There are many more, though, so um, depending on what is being mined um, can really happen all over the world. So let's uh, start by talking about workers' rights in the mining industry. I think we'll maybe have to do an entire episode just looking at mining in the future. Um, I'm not going to give a super in-depth explanation, but it might not surprise listeners to find that mine workers often experience unsafe working conditions, low wages, and uh, abuses on the job like excessive working hours and union busting. Working conditions in mines, like historically, um, were tied to, in some cases, just outright, you know, slavery, and then in other cases. Um, really abusive practices. And uh, as we've seen in like other industries where that's the case, the, um, industries like tea and chocolate, those practices may, are maybe not the same today, but like some of the same problems kind of carry forward. So um, I'll just give you an example. Uh, <laughs> one third of the world's tin comes from informal mines in Indonesia. And uh, in Bangka, Indonesia, um, I'm probably pronouncing that incorrectly, sorry, a worker dies in a landslide almost once per week because um, the practices are so bad there. Whoa, that is a lot of landslides. Yeah. I mean, it happens because um, if you're not managing the mines properly, they can be pretty unstable. So so yeah, mines aren't particularly safe places to work. Um In addition to things like um, dying in a landslide, lack of protective equipment and safety protocols can expose mining workers as well as nearby communities to toxic chemicals. It's a really big problem. Um, And that can lead to a range of health impacts. So, for example, gold mines are actually the leading source of um, mercury air pollution in the United States uh, because mercury is used in part of the mining process. Mining operations have also been linked to child labor and forced labor. It really depends on where the mine is, um, what, like, who is the mine company that's involved, um, and what are the local laws, how stringent are they, how well are they enforced. Um, So it can really vary, but in a lot of places where mining occurs, it's cheap because there are not very strong environmental regulations. Another thing to note, um, we'll talk about this more in the third part of our series, but Mining can also, in some cases, be connected to funding conflicts. Um, And one example of where that's true is in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. So there's actually been a movement to eliminate conflict minerals from um, electronic supply chains. And we'll talk more about that in part three. All right. Do you want to talk about manufacturing? Let's do it. So like other industries, electronics components manufacturing and assembly have undergone a process of offshoring in recent decades. So just to remind people what offshoring is, um, as sort of globalization has unfolded, it's um, the movement of manufacturing from close to where a product is sold to um, to sort of countries that have uh, weaker safety regulations, weaker worker regulations, and low wage labor. Uh, So that's definitely something that's happened in electronics industries. For example, semiconductor manufacturing actually moved offshore from the United States starting in the 1970s, and that was after there were reports that surfaced of contaminated drinking water that caused um, birth defects and cancer clusters among factory workers um, at different sites around the United States. So people started to agitate and start lawsuits about that because the United States actually had environmental protection laws 
um, and health and safety laws, and uh, then semiconductor manufacturing moved. That's like a pretty common story in electronics is um, the problem with toxic chemicals and how it's harming human health and the environment. Um, it's a big problem in mining. It's also a big problem in electronics manufacturing. So today, a lot of the electronics manufacturing actually happens in China, but some of that production is being moved towards other um, Asian countries like Malaysia, Indonesia, the Philippines, Vietnam, and India. Um, basically, that's because wages in China are going up, um, and so wages are now cheaper in those countries. So offshoring is sort of one big trend, and it's pushed manufacturing out to Asian countries. But in addition to that, the short production cycles that a lot of these um, products are on have also fueled a rise in precarious work. One example of this is that Chinese assembly factories will use student interns as a source of cheap and flexible labor. Um, and it is you are allowed to do this under Chinese law, um, and, and they do pay the interns, but employees frequently violate laws around, or employers are frequently violating laws around overtime and also you're only allowed to have a certain proportion of temporary and interns, um, temporary workers and interns in your um, assembly factories. And like, in a lot of cases, these companies are just flagrantly violating those laws to sort of take advantage of cheap student labor, basically. So that's a big problem, um, precarity in electronics manufacturing. And as well, electronics manufacturing has been associated with child labor and also forced labor. One example is in 2020, Lenovo laptops um, that were going to a school district in Alabama, they actually got stopped at the border by the U.S. Department of Commerce because um, they had a connection with the use of Chinese forced labor in Xinjiang province, and there were sanctions against that. So that's just one example. Um, and in a lot of cases, this kind of stuff doesn't get caught, right? So Foxconn, have you heard of Foxconn before? Yes, are they an internet company in the United States? They are not. Um, they're <laughs> a, they're, <laughs> it's, it's okay though. You, you know them associated with tech. Um, if people have heard of Foxconn before, they probably have heard of them um, associated with worker suicides about a decade ago. Oh, 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 I, uh, I, can I say that instead? <laughs> it happened 11 years ago, so <laughs> it's okay if you don't remember. Um, but some people listening might. So um, Foxconn's uh, more official name is Han High Precision Industry Co. Limited, um, but they're more commonly known as Foxconn, and they're the world's largest electronics manufacturer. So brands like Apple, Google, Microsoft, Amazon, HP, Dell, Huawei, a bunch of other companies, they contract Foxconn to manufacture their products. So I'm going to talk about Foxconn because um, they're sort of the leading manufacturer and the problems that they have with their workers' rights is really central to understanding ethics in um, electronics. So Foxconn is it's a Taiwanese company and the single largest employer in mainland China. Uh, they employ about 1.3 million people worldwide. And that means that actually they are the third largest employer worldwide. Um, only Walmart and McDonald's employ more people. <laughs> Walmart and McDonald's are the biggest employers. <laughs> McDonald's, I guess I shouldn't be too surprised. There's McDonald's, there's McDonald's in every country. But Walmart, <laughs> I guess they have like subsidiary companies that have different names. I think like Asda in the UK is owned by Walmart, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. This isn't a Walmart episode. <laughs> <laughs> That's coming, I'm sure. <laughs> Probably, yeah. Um, so one of the interesting things about Foxconn um, – and this was particularly true like five to 10 years ago, but it's still fairly true. A large portion of Foxconn's employees are at like a single mega site in um, the Chinese city of Shenzhen. Uh, and it's uh, known as either Foxconn City or the Longwa plant. And it's basically like this giant factory complex. Um, and at a certain point, um, there were an estimated 450,000 employees working in this complex, just to give you a sense of how big it is. Um, I think now they're not quite sure because it's very opaque, but um, now it's believed that there's less because um, Foxconn now has more sites um, around China. So they're not necessarily all clustered there, but there's a large number of employees um, in this factory uh, site. Um, and it would take nearly an hour to walk across the entire facility. So it's like a, it's like a proper city, you know. What? <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah, so think of like um like a city the with a population somewhere around like Hamilton, Ontario, like and it's just uh, an electronics company. Do the do the workers live there? Yeah. Um yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'll go into more detail on this. So the Longwa plant, it's very secretive. Um, so it's it's really hard to find out um, what's inside. But um, a journalist from The Guardian got in, um, and I'll just read a quote from that article. Security guards man each of the entry points. Employees can't get in without swiping an ID card. Drivers entering with delivery trucks are subject to fingerprint scans. A Reuters journalist was once dragged out of a car and beaten for taking photos from outside the factory walls. So it's very secretive. <laughs> they really don't want you getting inside. Um, and there have been really longstanding labor concerns at Foxconn factories. Um, so as I mentioned before, one of those most prominent of these was in 2010, when 18 employees attempted suicide by jumping off of the roof of the factory building. And uh, it's not, this isn't like the only time there have been issues at Foxconn. There have been a number of like protests that have happened. Um, workers have smuggled out like notes saying, help me from the factory into like products. Like there have been sort of several incidents, um, but this suicide cluster, you know, 18 people attempting suicide within a year drew pretty substantial international attention. Not all of them died. Uh, I think 11 did, but don't quote me on that number. That the ones that survived suffer like crippling injuries and basically can't work now. And, you know, there's not really good disability supports in China. So not a good situation for anybody. The suicides were really like linked to the conditions at um, the Longwan plant. Um, and uh, there was an investigation that a Hong Kong based NGO called Students and Scholars Against Corporate Misbehavior. Um, they they looked at what was going on in the Foxconn facilities, and they found that workers were experiencing long working hours without overtime pay. They had to go to mandatory unpaid meetings. They were under constant surveillance. Uh, they were also, um, for making mistakes, people would be forced to publicly read statements of self-criticism. And this is actually one of the practices that was most tied to the suicides. There were also punishments such as fines for not meeting high hourly quotas, and there was a ban on conversation in the workplace. So most of these things aren't like um, without precedent, but they're characteristic of sweatshops, I would say. Um, I'll read another quote from that Guardian article because I think it's useful as well. Since the iPhone is such a compact, complex machine, putting one together correctly requires sprawling assembly, assembly lines of hundreds of people who build, inspect, test, and package each device. One worker said that 1,700 iPhones passed through her hands every day. She was in charge of wiping a special polish on the display. That works out to about three screens a minute for 12 hours a day. More meticulous work like fastening chipboards and assembling back covers was slower. These workers have a minute apiece for each iPhone. That's still 600 to 700 iPhones a day. Failing to meet a quota or making a mistake can draw public condemnation from superiors. Workers are often expected to stay silent and may draw rebukes from their bosses for asking to use the restroom. Like, if you think about that as what people's work days are. And that wasn't to just sort of shame the iPhone, although definitely Apple um, should be pushing for better worker supports. There are a number of companies that buy from Foxconn. Um, I don't want us to get sued. But yeah, that's just to highlight like how many, how many pieces people are handling in a day at these facilities, how like tight their quotas are, and um, how little freedom they have to speak to one another and to use the restroom. Another thing, you would ask whether people live in these facilities, and they do. Um, and that's another relevant dimension. Um, Foxconn workers are, they're typically migrants. I wasn't able to find from where, but I think it's primarily from other parts of China. And so Foxconn City is not only a workplace, but it's also where employees live. And that gives the company immense power over people. So workers will sleep in dormitories on the complex. They eat at the complex. Um, there are like... Um, you know, they socialize the complex, their movie theaters and stuff, which is actually one of the things Steve Jobs highlighted to minimize the suicides issue when it happened. Oh, my God. <laughs> Steve Jobs was trash. <laughs> wow. Yeah. That. Yeah. Is, mm. So so like there there are like the facilities for people to live there. Um, but it can actually be really isolating for workers because you're always on your work site. Right. 
Um, so uh, Tian Yu, um, a worker who attempted suicide, reported that her shifts were always being changed um, and her roommates were also from other parts of China. So she couldn't really understand what they were saying because there were different dialects. Um, and that led to like an immense sense of isolation. You know, she was um, she called the complex, quote, a massive place of strangers, which I think is um, really highlights what the experience is like. So um Tian Yu, um, she received no wages for her first month because of an administrative error. Um, and to fix that error, she had to take a bus to another factory of 130,000 people where she tried to get people and nobody would help her to locate her wage card. Um, and shortly after that, her secondhand cell phone broke. And because she hadn't been paid, she couldn't afford to replace it So because she had no money. So she was like, she didn't know the people she was living with. Her family is like, far away and she can't contact them with her phone. So she attempted suicide shortly after that. Um, and she had only worked at the facility for 37 days and she's like paralyzed now. <sighs> so that's the rest of her life. Oh, I didn't think we would have an episode that was darker than clothing yet. Here we are. <laughs> yeah, it's, um, it's bad. Uh, and you know, some workers report that like they don't, that they haven't had as experiences that were this bad. I mean, not everybody has their wages withheld like that was an administrative error, although it did happen in several other cases that I had heard about. With one guy, he was threatening to jump several years after this incident happened for a similar issue, and eventually the company backed down and like actually helped him fix the administrative error, so he got his wages. Um, so it's yeah, it's it's just a bad situation. Um, and you, as a worker on these facilities, have like no power because you have you don't have a government that's willing to intervene. You don't have the social capital from your community because you're isolated from your community. Um, and you, you live in like a, an oppressive facility where um, bosses aren't there to support you and they publicly like humiliate you for making errors. And that's like a, a really effective means of punishment. So, so after the suicides garnered some media attention, um, Foxconn did install nets on the roofs to um oh, what? Yeah, that was their response. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Um like uh, yeah, uh, that's not like I guess that's fine but you're kind of missing the point Foxconn. Um they also forced workers to sign pledges that they wouldn't self-harm, <laughs> which is also, I wow. think, missing the point in a big way. <laughs> wow. Yeah. So reporting suggests that there generally haven't been many meaningful improvements in the working conditions in the last decade. I, I that What you just described to me sounds like it belongs in like, like a comedic science fiction book, like, like something Douglas Adams might have written. Yeah. As just like an absolute like ridiculous like situation that you've taken to the max and like, oh, this would never happen in real life. So it's it's fine to write about. But it's like, no, no, that's what you just described to me is not that. Yeah, the callousness of responding to 18 people trying to take their lives by being like, oh, we installed net. It's, it's fine. Job done. <laughs> Holy shit. Let's go make Holy some more uh, cell phones. Sorry, I just had to sit with that for a second. <laughs> no, it's all good. We're nearing the end of the human rights part of the episode. Um, I don't have a lot in terms of what you can do because um, we'll talk more about that in the next episode. Um, but one option that I'm going to flag at several points in this series is you can buy a Fairphone. Um, for pretty much every metric, Fairphone is like the best option that you have. Uh, Fairphone, it's a, created by a social enterprise that was trying to deal with um, the fucked up elements of the electronics industry. So if you need a new smartphone, one option is the Fairphone. It's a modular phone, um, which basically means that it's designed explicitly so you can repair and replace all the parts. And uh, the reason I don't have one yet is because previous iterations only worked in Europe, but their newest version now works everywhere in the world. So I'm definitely going to go with the all next time rad. I get a phone. Yeah. They've also mapped their entire supply chain to ensure that they source materials responsibly. We'll talk more about why that's important when we talk about conflict minerals. Um, but you can even imagine, you know, like understanding who your 750 suppliers are or wh whatever number it is, is it an important first step to understanding how ethical they are, you know? <laughs> <laughs> 
And uh, Fairphone is the only smartphone company that received a positive rating from Ethical Consumer's mobile phones guide. So that's another option. If you go to Ethical Consumer, they've got several guides on which com- which uh, like laptop companies might be the best for you, uh, which cell phone companies. I find they're often UK specific, but when it comes to electronics, because they're big global brands, um, it's really applicable even if you live in North America. So I would really recommend that. Uh, the other thing you can do is um, support um, companies that have strong supply chain traceability efforts and that have um, codes of conduct that they actually are holding companies to. Um, you can also use your voice to tell, um, you know, whatever phone or computer company you're going with um, that you want to see them improving their working conditions for subcontractors. So that is uh, that is human rights. How you feeling? I mean shit like (laughs) this foxconn place sounds so horrible and yet it's the third biggest employer on the planet and like every major electronics company is buying from them so what do you do like we need more we need less of a monopoly here we need more manufacturers (laughs) or something right like what what do you do about like something that that that's that big yeah, I don't know. It's really tricky. Because um, it's not like HP or or Intel could just like pull their manufacturing from there because there's nowhere else that could keep up with the level of product that they're putting out. Yeah, I don't know. It's really hard for me to disentangle in my mind because I generally like I, I'm a globalist, you know, I, I think it's really good that we're interdependent around the world. But a lot of the issues with electronics comes down to the way our trade agreements are set up right now it really doesn't allow you to put in place any meaningful worker protections. And we're not really requiring companies. There's, there is more that countries could do unilaterally to require countries to uh, make sure that like forced labor and child labor and stuff like that isn't happening. But we don't have laws like that right now. So the reality is just like, how do you even like you can't even get in a Foxconn facility? How do you assure that working conditions are, this, are um are good. The thing that's most fucked to me about Foc- uh, Foxconn is that it's also high tech. Like, there's something in my mind that says, like, um, you know, like a garment shop that's a sweatshop. Like, it's evil, but in a way that I comprehend um, because it's like, okay, yeah, if there was better capacity, you'd have more safety, maybe, and wages might be higher. But Foxconn is like high tech, you know? <laughs> it's like it's like a Google campus, but dystopian. <sighs> I guess a Google campus is also dystopian in a way. <laughs> But even more dystopian. <laughs> I, I get what I get. What you're trying to say, I suppose. Like, I mean, if you were imagining a better world where we could still have our electronics, because I don't know about you, but I am fully addicted to electronics. And yeah, I could learn to live without them. But I, in my perfect world, I'm imagining they're still there. You know, so I, I guess like these companies that are hoarding wealth at the top with their billionaire CEOs, if they were more equitable in how they distributed their funds, they could spend that money on having their own manufacturing like places, you know? So it's like, instead of everyone sending to this one evil place so that they have no choice but to continue sending to them because nobody can keep up except for this evil place, you take care of your own stuff, you know, and you hire your own workers. Yeah, or there could be requirements that... um that like working conditions and wages um, were at an adequate level, or at least that people aren't like being exposed to toxic chemicals or whatever. And if you can like require big multinational companies, especially ones that are brand sensitive to report on that kind of stuff, you can, I think, get a lot of stuff done. And that's, I think, going to be the story of conflict minerals. I I don't want to like preview it too much, but supply chain transparency coupled with legislation actually works pretty well. Okay. Okay. Well, we'll talk about that more. But yeah, just the Foxconn thing. I'm just, I'm just absolutely flabbergasted that, that, that those sorts of horrible human rights abuses are happening and it's affecting like almost all electronics manufacturers. Like what? That's wild. Yeah. What do you do? Right? Like, (laughs) yeah. They employ almost as many people as Walmart. What the fuck? (laughs) And I'm like, you know, maybe, maybe no single company should be that powerful, but it's, but if it wasn't evil, then I guess why not, right? Like, sure, let there be a city that belongs to this one company. As long as it's doing good, I guess, 
that would be okay, but there's no example of that. Is it even possible? I don't know. Well, okay, there might be one example of it. I haven't looked into this case that directly, but Hershey seemed like it was a chocolate town that was actually fine for quite a period of time. They resisted capitalism in a big way, and they, it actually seemed like a pretty nice place to live. Listeners, please tell me if I'm like wrong about that. But. Yeah, I had a few. I, I don't know why, but I had a sense that the Hershey town was actually like really horrific. So uh, someone correct us. One of us has a, a very mistaken <laughs> view on this. The uh, Business Wars series that I listened to on this made me feel as though it was good, but maybe uh, maybe it's not. <laughs> but in all other cases, it's just dystopian and fucked. Like, you used to basically work in company towns when you were a coal miner. That was pretty fucked up. Like, yeah, it's a... Uh, I mean, those tea plantations are another example. It's not generally good news when you have to live far away from your family on, like, company compounds. They have way too much power when that happens. I mean, speaking as someone who did do a contract on a cruise ship, that's not sounding completely unfamiliar when you describe it that way. <laughs> yeah, and the working conditions you described there were horrific, so. <laughs> <laughs> I had a pretty good, too, so. But, okay, well, on that note, I am so invested in this research that you've done <laughs> and the story that you're telling. I am, like, riveted, so I'm super excited to do, what, three more episodes on this? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, great. Well, thank you for listening, everyone. You can get us on Twitter at Pullback Podcast. You can let us know what you think about anything that we had to talk about. This has like, been really fun for me. I love this topic. So if anyone wants to discuss, please do. Otherwise, we'll catch you on our next episode um, soon. What an ending, Kyla. <laughs> <laughs>